Well, friends, have your Christmas preparations started yet? Some of you are saying, oh, please, don't even start talking about it. It's still November. And others are probably way ahead of us. For me as a youngster growing up, St Andrew's Day was always the start. I recall us having St Andrew's Day as a, a holiday from school and travelling with my mum and my big sister into Glasgow on the train from Wishaw. We would make our way into Glasgow. I don't remember us ever going to any other shops apart from Lewis's on Argyle Street. Of course, not to be confused with the much newer John Lewis, but Lewis is on Argyle Street. And we would wait patiently on those back stairs as we took our turn to go to visit Santa in his grotto. And then we would go to the cafeteria, we'd have something to eat, we'd get the train back home to Wishaw, and we would put up the Christmas tree. Always the same wee Christmas tree. Always the same wee decorations. Always the same wee set of lights with every bulb getting taken out and put back in again to find what one had the bad connection. And some of you have been there. And how thankful we are for modern fairy lights that don't seem to have these problems. But when does Christmas start for you? In terms of marketing, it's been going on for weeks now. In America, it probably starts this coming Friday, the day right after Thanksgiving. And of course, Black Friday sales are every much as part of our life here in the UK as, as they are across the Atlantic. But others might say, well, when did we actually start observing Christmas? Was it within the modern era? And then I can hear others and I can understand where you're coming from and have sympathy with you when they say, oh, surely none of this is really about Christmas. Surely Christmas is about the shepherds and the wise men and ultimately about the baby in the manger. And I couldn't disagree with you there. Not one bit. You know, but even at the manger, we haven't found the star. For Christmas, when we reflect upon and give thanks for the incarnation, the coming of God in flesh as a human, has its origins long before the birth of the Lord Jesus there in Bethlehem more than 2,000 years ago. The heart of the story of the coming of the Saviour is the story of the God who made us. The earliest days of human history, Adam, he created, and Eve, he created them. The first man, the first woman, created by God for communion with God, for intimacy with God. In a perfect world, in perfect harmony. Yet is that the world that we see around us today? Is that the world that you live in? The world that I live in? It's not. And we know it's not. And yet with Christmas coming, there is often that hope in people's hearts that somehow we may find a better place, a, a better time. It's that time when lots of sentimental films come on the television or Netflix or whatever service some of you might use. It's the time when all the music starts playing. Perhaps one of the most wistful of all those songs. It's the song that Johnny Mathis had a hit with so many years ago. When a child is born. Yet you know, as you really listen to the words of that song, you discover that the longing is unfulfilled because Mathis doesn't find his hope in the Christ who came. Instead, he's hoping for someone who is yet to come. Yet, friends, as 
we find ourselves now, as it were, on the, the run into Christmas. I want us to stop and think, why? Why would God have done this? Why would God become flesh and come among us? You may say, well, because, as you said a moment ago, he created us for communion with him and intimacy with him. And, and, and that's clearly what, what God desires. Yet we would be wrong. Oh yes, it's true that God does desire these things. But Christ did not come into this world simply so that we could know that friendship. Oh, there are deeper issues. Deeper issues that could only be resolved by the coming of Christ. And I want us this morning, and that's the first of, of four messages in the lead up to Christmas, to think really about not only why did Christ come, but why did he need to come? Why did it need to happen this way? What was wrong with things the way they were? Let's read together from Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, where we read, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. I don't know about you, but when we read verse 5, the wickedness of man great on the earth and every intention of the thoughts of his heart only evil continually, surely there are some of us are tempted to ask, was it like that back then too? Because it's hard sometimes to, to watch the news or to read a newspaper. And not be hurt by some of the evil that we hear of. But as we think of those verses which we read, there's language there that speaks of a God who regrets, a God who grieves, a God who is sorry. And we could perhaps find ourselves asking, is, is this appropriate language for the sovereign, transcendent God? Well, yes, because it is God's own language. This is God's word. And what it is it that brings him to regret and to grieve? It's the wickedness of man. A tragedy of a twisted and distorted and turned upside down world. Man was created for a loving relationship with God. We were made for love. Made not only to love God, but to be, by, to be loved by God. Two weeks ago, we read from Matthew chapter 22. You'll remember the encounter that the Pharisees had with Jesus, came up to him and said, what is the great commandment? And Jesus said in Matthew 22, you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul and your mind. That's what God commands of us. In God's eyes, love for him and obedience to him 
actually go hand in hand. And if we love the lawgiver, then surely we will be most at home when we are living within those good boundaries that he has set for us in his word. For two or three months now, at the start of our Tuesday evening prayer meeting on Zoom, we've been reading a stanza from the 119th Psalm. You cannot spend long in that psalm without recognising that time after time, the psalmist speaks of, of God's law as being something that he loves, something that he rejoices in. And surely, we want to please the one we love. In an earthly sense, that must be true. And in a heavenly sense also, for those of us who would say that we love God, then surely our desire would be to, to please him and to love him. That's what we're created for. But that's not the way things are now. What became of that perfect communion between Adam and Eve and, and God? Sin. That's what became of it. Something changed. Man's sin separated him from a holy God. Man no longer loves God. But the fact that mankind no longer love God doesn't mean that mankind stops loving. But tragically all too often it is love for self that takes the place of our love for God. We're, we're almost hardwired into that position through, through the fall, through Adam's rebellion. As it's sometimes said, in Adam's fall, we fell all. Think even of our children. They're not usually very old before they very much give the impression that they reckon the world are, revolves around them. It's all about them. Yet when it comes to rules, never once <laughs> can I remember either of our children asking us to give them more rules. No. As they grow, what they want is, is freedom from that parental authority. Now it's right and good to, to take responsibility for ourselves as, as we get older. But behind it is a desire to to break free from the loving rules and, and boundaries that have been placed for our good by those who love us. Even as parents, we might say, as those who believe that we know better. Then how much more is it right that our Heavenly Father, who loves us and knows what is best, would place loving rules around us? But man doesn't want those rules. No. Mankind has by and large said, no, we will live by our rules. Goes right back to the garden where Adam and Eve sinned and wanted to do things their way. Yet within a few generations, we have come to the verses that we read here. Verses that we read, I'll turn to them again there and Genesis chapter 6. The wickedness of man was great on the earth. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God was grieved. Grieved. It doesn't say that God was angry. Although his wrath is real. It says... God is grieved. Not just the almighty, omnipotent, sovereign God of all creation, but a God who grieves for his creation, a creation that has turned its back on him. Just pause and think. 
Think how great is God's love. For it is only when one has loved greatly that one will grieve greatly. Grief of a lost loved one. Or perhaps even grief for a lost love. Perhaps even a lost relationship. Lost relationship with someone who was dear to us. A lost relationship with a son or a daughter or a parent. We have a God who knows what it is to grieve over lost relationships. Because he looked upon mankind and saw what had become of that love which in his original perfect plan was a love to be enjoyed, communion to be experienced with him. God looks on. He cannot look on passively. He cannot look on as a bystander would look on at perhaps something happening in the street. Because God's involved. The evil that we see in the world around us is not just evil that men do to other men. And violence in crime, in other forms of sinfulness. No. Our sin, our waywardness, our selfishness is ultimately against God. Remember David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah? Taking Bathsheba, although he knew that Sure, he knew that she was someone else's wife. And then having her husband killed in order to try and cover up his sin. And that lovely account in the scriptures when, when Nathan the prophet is sent to David and, and tells him, as it were, a parable. And David is outraged when, when he hears of this man who has, who has, as it were, taken someone else's lamb. And Nathan says, David, you're the man. And David is brought by God's Spirit to true repentance. And he cries out in Psalm 51, It is not, it is against you, O God, that I have sinned. It is against you. Oh yes, he had sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba. But the root problem was that David had failed to love God as he should. Or if he had, he would have obeyed him as he should. You see, this is personal, friends. This is personal to, to you and to me as well. The measure of our obedience toward God relates directly to the measure of our love for God. But how does God respond? Does God turn a blind eye to all of this? No, he doesn't. Instead, he, reads, he responds in, in judgment. He has every right to. After all, every good and perfect gift that God has given has effectively been thrown in his face. And God in judgment takes the decision to wipe out mankind. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. It grieved him to his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Judgment. Friends, the judgment of God upon sin is something that is far too serious.
for anyone to ignore. Yet on every occasion, when God brings judgment, God also provides for salvation. This is not the end. This is not the end of the story. The Bible does not end as it were in, in chapter 6 of Genesis. Because verse 8 holds out hope. Verse 8 holds out hope where it says, But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. It's not the end. Because Noah becomes the object of God's grace, even in judgment. God makes a covenant with Noah, a solemn promise. Then God would go on and make a covenant with Abraham, a covenant that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through Abraham's seed. And the Apostle Paul, writing in the New Testament, makes quite clear that the seed of Abraham is ultimately Christ. The Christ who comes. The ultimate redeeming purpose of God was not simply to place Noah and his immediate family in the ark that they might weather the flood and the storm and go from that ark to repopulate the world. No. The ultimate redeeming purpose of God was to send his son. That's why the incarnation matters. It is God's saving plan and purpose for a redeemed and rescued humanity. The problem of wickedness, the wickedness that existed before the flood, the wickedness that came all too quickly after the flood, the wickedness that even exists today in the world around us, is not ultimately a social problem. As if, Improving things socially would bring a new dawn. It's not a, a circumstances problem that, oh, if, 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 if people didn't have some of the challenges in life that they have, things would be, problem, would be better. No, no. Ultimately, it's a heart problem. A heart problem. The heart, what you might call our guidance system, has been left without a compass. That is so characteristic of life today. So many people with no moral compass, they simply do what seems right to them. You know, friends, the Bible tells us that even way back in the Old Testament, every man did what seemed right in his own eyes. We're not only alienated from God, but we have lost any true sense of direction back to God. Sheep, by and large, don't find their way home. The shepherd has to go and find them and bring them back. So God comes to us. God comes in flesh. The Son of God the eternal second person of the Trinity, existent with the Father. And he comes into this fallen world. And he shows us what perfect love looks like. I have come to do your will. And not that that was not costly, friends. Not that that was co not costly. Think of Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he goes to the cross, pouring out his heart to God his Father and saying, 
If it be possible, let this cup be taken from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That perfect love worked out in obedience. Oh, amazing love. Oh, what sacrifice the Son of God given for me. My life he lives and my death he dies that I might live. He comes. That baby born in Bethlehem. That baby laid in a manger. He comes and he stands in the place of sinners. He bears their judgment that God might in grace draw repentant sinners to himself and see that perfect love restored. That's why Christmas. To bring men back to God. And to see that Perfect love restored, friends. One day it will be. One day we will know that same perfect love for God, that perfect communion and harmony that was known there in the garden. As the hymn writer wrote many years ago, McShane, Robert Murray McShane, when I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty not my own, when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Friends, do you believe there is a day coming if you are the Lord's, if you trust in him, when you will not only stand before him, clothed in a beauty that's not yours, it's Christ. You will see him as he is. We will love him with hearts set free from sin. No sin. Then we will fully know how much we owe. This is the glorious hope of redemption, friends. Is this possible? That we could know this, you know, the, the sin defeated? Darkness defeated and Eden restored. Yes, this is possible because love came down at Christmas. Christ has come. Christ has died. Christ has risen. We need no longer live for self but live for the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Live joyfully for his pleasure, not for his own. Yet is it as easy as that? Well, if you find it as easy as that, friend, I just marvel at that measure of grace God has given you. Because for many of us, myself included, it's a struggle. Because there is still that old self. We want to please ourselves rather than please God. Is there hope in the Christ of Christmas for us? Yes, there is. To seek to live daily in that closer walk with him. Not only is there hope, but there's eternal life. But perhaps there's someone listening to this message. And in your heart, you know that right now you are not living under the Lordship of Christ. You're living for yourself. Maybe there was a time when you did walk with him. But your path has taken you far away from God. Friends, there's a wonderful to him that says... There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a way that is open and all may go in. At Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. Friends, the gospel that, as it were, culminates in the cross is that gospel that begins in Bethlehem where Christ is born for us. 
but perhaps you have never trusted him. Trust him now. Turn from sin. Believe in him. Perhaps it's time to seek God's forgiveness and find his grace. Why was the incarnation necessary? Why do we need Christmas? Because even though we so loved ourselves that we grieved God to his very heart, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Friends, the message of Christmas is the message of the cross. I pray that this Christmas season you will find in Christ everything you need. Pray with me now, our gracious Father and our God. How we thank you that redemption's plan was why Christ came. From even before the earth's foundation, that plan was set in place that one day, although the people who you had created would turn their back on you, that Christ, in giving himself upon the cross, would purchase a people for himself, by himself. Oh, Father, we thank you for that redemption that is ours by your grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, would you, Father, work in our hearts such love for you, that our love for self would be forgotten. Would the Holy Spirit work in us to make us more and more want what you want? These things, Father, we ask for your glory, but ask them believing that that which brings you glory is that which also brings us good. All this, Father, we ask in Jesus' precious name, the name of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. Friends, let's bring our worship today to a close as we sing of that great love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvellous! How wonderful is my Saviour's love for me. <laughs> 